Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we have people joining us from all over the world. Uh, my name is David Wilkins and I'm the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. And I wanna welcome almost 750 people who have registered for this event on how the Global 100 is responding to the big four. The fact that so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to be with us here is a testament to the importance of this topic. And quite frankly, it's also an indication of the importance of the kind of work that we're doing here at the Center on the Legal Profession. The Center really is dedicated to three interrelated goals. The first and most important is conducting world-class unbiased empirical research on the cutting edge issues that are facing our profession today. Second, we try to use that research to create new and innovative ways of teaching law students and professionals. And finally, and most important, we build on that research and teaching to try to create bridges between the academy and the profession in which we both bring what we hope is the best of the learning and research of the academy to the profession and learn from the profession about how these issues are really playing out in the real world. This webinar really underscores the synergy of these three goals. That is the webinar grows out of an ongoing sustained research initiative at the center to understand what we refer to as the evolving ecosystem that now characterizes the global market for legal and other related services. By ecosystem, by ecosystem, excuse me, we mean just that, that we've gone from a world in which we thought of law firms as the only providers of legal services to one that now has numerous uh, entrants and providers, including of course, in-house legal departments, but increasingly technology companies, uh, temporary and agile staffing companies, project and process management companies, design research firms, and increasingly multidisciplinary professional service firms, the most important of which, of course, are the big four. For over a decade, we have been tracking the entry, or I should say re-entry of the big four into the market for legal services. And we wanted to see how the rest of the ecosystem was, res was responding to this new challenge. The, the webinar also underscores uh, that we have been bringing together some of the leading professionals around the world uh, to understand this new dynamic. And in fact, four of the participants you will hear from uh, have been involved in one way or another in our executive education programs that we started here now more than a decade ago and that are ably run now by my colleague Scott Westfall uh, around leadership in law firms, leadership in corporate counsel, uh, in a, in a serving clients, innovation, a whole range of programs. And part of what we'll be talking about today uh, my colleague Brian Fong and I, who is the research director at the center, uh, will be bringing to our law students in a seminar that we're teaching on cutting edge research on the legal profession. And finally, we've been chronicling everything that we're doing in our digital magazine, which we call The Practice. Uh, we started that uh, magazine back in 2014 uh, to try to fill an important gap in the ecosystem, if you will, of the way in which uh, we communicate about what's happening in the legal profession. That is in law, there really isn't much that's between 
scholarly pub publications like let's say the Harvard Law Review and important journalistic publications like the American Lawyer or the National Lawyer or Bloomberg News. There isn't much that fills the gap that say you see in business of the Harvard Business Review or The Economist uh, or other similar kinds of publications that bring academic research to busy professionals and learn from professionals to feed back into that research. That's the goal of the practice. And in the practice, we've been chronicling this shift to a kind of global, increasingly multidisciplinary ecosystem in the space of sophisticated corporate legal services. We started in 2014 at our, our inaugural issue, which we called the Global Age of More for Less. In 2015, we did a whole issue around disruptive innovation. We were one of the first ones to bring Clayton Christensen's uh, work on innovation to the legal profession uh, in 2016. We had already flagged the reemergence of the big four and the market for legal services as a major issue for our readers. And we were also tracking uh, the critically important role that general councils around the world are playing in driving this new ecosystem. And that built on research that we've been doing around the changing role of general councils around the world. In 2017, we focused on law firm strategies and how law firms were adapting to this new reality. And there we featured an article which uh, featured the work of Bob Couture, which was the first time that we worked together on a project. Uh, in 2018, we began to chronicle how this new ecosystem was now involving a whole new models of legal professionals and professionals uh, involved in spaces of law from paraprofessionals on the one hand uh, to engineers, design research professionals, uh, systems designers, computer uh, engineers, all of whom are participating in a world that where legal services are no longer just the province of lawyers. In 2019, we began to look specifically at this proliferation of alternative legal service providers uh, in an issue in which we argued that we ought to stop calling them alternative providers, taking the alternative out of alternative legal service providers, and instead understanding that they are all a part of this ecosystem, sometimes competing, sometimes collaborating, always pushing, which has led law firms to move beyond traditional practices, but not necessarily all the way to Christians' disruptive innovation model, and instead to practice what we are calling adaptive innovation, in which they take the best of their traditional practices, but try to adapt their structures, their hiring, their personnel, uh, their methodologies to this new reality. And then in 2020, we looked to see how the COVID crisis, the looming global economic crisis, increasingly global calls for social and racial justice are turbocharging the changes in the ecosystem that we've been seeing going on now for the last several years. Which brings us to today and the current issue of the practice, which is how the global 100 law firms are responding primarily to the introduction of the big four, but more generally to this new corporate ecosystem in this new COVID and post-COVID environment. We are very fortunate uh, to have a, a number of fantastic people to guide us in this important conversation beginning with my friend, Bob Couture. Uh, Bob is uniquely qualified uh, to help us to understand this journey. He spent 15 years as the chief operating officer at McGuire Woods, one of the most important law firms in the country. But before that, he spent 20 years as a senior vice president at IBM Global Services, in which 
he thought a lot about understanding professional services in a new way. What is managed services? What is an integrated solution? And Bob has brought that understanding of the market to the market for legal services and to this project. Bob is going to now take about 15 or 20 minutes or so to present to you uh, what he has learned in a quite unique and fascinating research project on this set of issues, which we will then follow uh, with a panel discussion of terrific professionals involved in the process and viewing the process from the most important perspective, which as I said, is that of the general counsel. And I'll introduce our panelists in a second. Uh, but before turning it over to Bob, just a couple of housekeeping matters. First, uh, this uh, session is being recorded and we will eventually post the recording uh, on our website so that those who couldn't attend will be able to see it. Uh, and we really want to involve you and your uh, voices in this discussion. And so we will be uh, taking questions all along. Please use the Q&A function, uh, which you probably are all familiar with now in Zoom. And uh, my colleagues behind the scene will be looking through the questions and giving them to me, and I will be incorporating them uh, into our discussion segment. But for now, let me turn it over to Bob Couture. Bob, the floor is yours. Hello, David, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to share out my screen here. And hopefully now you can all see that. The title is the Global 100 Response to the big three or big four and three strategies. Um, this project was initiated uh, after a lot of uh, work was done about what the big four were doing. And so logically the easy question was, what are the uh, global 100 large law firms around the world actually doing in response to that? So it was a fairly simple premise. And so for those of you who haven't been uh, following too closely over the last uh, 20 years, I'd like to just give you a very brief history and background. Well, we don't seem to be moving here. Let me stop share. Bob, you have to click in your presentation and then it'll advance. from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you can see that. This is uh, work uh, that was done uh, by David Wilkins and his colleague Maria Esteban Ferrer in 2018. And it gave the, the history of what's happened here, starting with in 2000, we had the big five essentially threatening to enter some of the US markets. The very next year, the scandals uh, from the financial uh, services difficulties resulted in restrictions on the big four. We lost one along the way and, and their offering of non-audit services to audit clients. Uh, then Sarbanes-Oxley was thought at the time to make the big four no longer a threat to big law in the US. So this has been talked about for quite a long time. And then we entered what we call a a quiet period for the next 15 years. But here are some of the primary findings from that piece of work that uh, David and Maria did. And the first is that there's been significant growth in size and importance beyond just tax advisory. The reason this was a research project is because it's not widely advertised by the big four relative to what they're doing and when they're doing it. So it takes a, a, an amount of digging, David would call it stalking, of their presence and the kind of work that they were doing. It was found that they were have a, a good presence in employment and immigration law, restructuring and insolvency, 
telecom media uh, and technology law. And also quite interesting, high-end uh, M&A practices in capital markets and finance. So the question is, are they really doing this? And my view is that the proof of that is that the big four practices are now recognized by major ranking services, such as Chambers, the Legal 500, Best Lawyers, and Financial Times. And to conclude, their presence, we see PwC in 85 countries, Deloitte in 69, KPMG in 53, EY in uh, almost 70, and total employment, and this is as of three years ago, as best could be determined with over 10,000 lawyers. So now we'll say, what have the uh, Global 100 been doing? And they have had some press releases, but typically you will not see uh, strategy articulated in press releases, but some of it was revealed by these uh, recent announcements. In 2015, DLA launched Noble Street Consultancy, which was fundamentally a uh, M&A and financing practice for three specific industries. Hogan announced a consulting arm uh, after bringing in a PwC hire in 2017. And in 2018, Minter Ellison, an Australian firm, brought in Annette Kermit as their new CEO, and she was a senior uh, executive at E&Y. Uh, in 19, Eversheds announced the launch of Conexo, and we're thrilled today to be joined by the leader of Conexo, Graham Richardson. You'll hear from him a little bit later. White and Case hired uh, Deloitte's legal management consulting leader, uh, Megan Kelly, who also has joined us today, uh, reporting directly to the chairman. And also in 2019, Reed Smith became the first international law firm to gain a, an ABS or alternative business structure license uh, from the UK's SRA. This will allow Reed Smith under this um, ABS structure to take investment from non-lawyers into their firm. And Denton's uh, ad in 2019 articulated their uh, US strategy uh, as it was called chasing the big four's uh, footprint. And we're very fortunate to be jo joined by Joe Andrews, who is the uh, global chairman of Denton's today. Paul Hastings uh, in 2020 announced a new life sciences consulting group with uh, a Deloitte hire and Ropes and Gray announced a very interesting consulting offering, uh, which is basically around compliance management, but they're using uh, experts and data scientists and analytics and behavioral science to power that practice. So these are the press releases, but our question was how have the uh, big, uh, law firms across the world responded beyond the press releases. So we initiated the project in 2020 to in, uh, do in-depth interviews of leaders at Global 100 firms. We interviewed 20 firm leaders from chairmen, COOs, uh, strategy heads, managing partners, and executive committee members. And we wanted to understand the threat or their, assess their understanding of the threat when they thought uh, the big four could impact their business, whether or not they were going to make any changes in their practice areas, uh, whether or not they'd add additional professionals and what skill enhancements they would see from their partners or any incentive plan modifications that they thought were necessary. So here are the, just the statistical results. With a big four familiarity, um, about a third of them were very familiar, almost half were medium and about 20% said we really don't know very much about them. And their expected impact on their business was about again, a third said there'd be a high impact. And by the way, that isn't necessarily the same 35% that had a high familiarity. Um, but there were almost half of them had a fairly low estimate of what kind of an impact that would make on their business. And when we ask about the timing of the impact, half of them said right now and half said over five years, there was nobody in, their, in the intermediate term in that regard. We found that about a third of the firms had direct experience with big four competition, but yet about 
uh, didn't know if they'd lost business. Maybe about 20% said they had, and about 30% said they had not lost business in the big four. The greatest geographical impact, uh, no surprise, is uh, seen to be in Europe, uh, followed by Asia and then Latin America. And 10% said, we're not so sure. Another 10% said, probably every place in the world. And when you look at the practice area impact, the first and highest percentage was uh, tax, which is quite normal. Uh, but then if you look at the next two areas, compliance and regulatory, that's 25 and 20 percent. I would actually combine those to say that more than likely compliance, compliance and regulatory fits together. So what we see is probably almost half of the practice area Im impact is around those two. And then you can see some other things on immigration, general corporate work, uh, and some M&A labor and IP. When I asked whether or not they'd expand their practice offerings, about a third said they would. Uh, and the rest of them said, no, their practices are just fine where they sit today. About 40% said they're gonna hire new professionals without JDs. So this is to build a team of multidisciplinary experts that uh, goes beyond just those uh, in the legal profession. 60% said they wouldn't. And for those new, those people who would hire new people, uh, they said they would be project managers, client managers, industry consultants, technology experts, and data scientists. When I ask about hiring professionals from the big four, about a third said they would, two thirds said they would not. And this interesting question about an integrated uh, multidisciplinary solution, uh, only about a quarter said they were gonna do that. The rest said they weren't interested. Very important question about new client relationships with a, a different approach. And about a third fully expects that they will see relationships with client uh, contacts outside of the legal department, particularly in the lines of business. When we asked about new skills from your partners, the majority, 60% said, yes, our partners are gonna to have to learn to do things a little bit different in this new world. And those areas of expertise were articulated as solution selling, emotional intelligence, and project and client management. And the final question about that was whether or not you're gonna make changes to your incentive plan. A little surprising to me, 90% um, said no, only 10% said that they had to change their incentive plans to follow their new approach. So these, these statistics are very informative, but they really don't tell us what the strategy is as a firm. But through the discussions I had, uh, with the executives, there were three distinct strategies that emerged. The first is we're not gonna do anything different or no change in operations or practices. The second was we're gonna pursue a complementary relationship with the big four. So they were taking a affirmative uh, effort to go and make those relationships useful and deliverable to clients. And the third said we would be transforming our firm to deliver multi-professional integrated solutions. Now, the logical question that came next was, why do all the firms within the Global 100 segment make different strategic choices? And I think that's because the Global 100 is a segment that only tells you about revenue, not much about the firms and what kind of work that they do. So further segmentation, I think, is very useful to understand the behaviors that we identified. All of the approaches that people are taking, I would say would be reasonable and make strategic sense depending on where they sit and what the objectives of the firm were. But it appears that the most critical factors influencing the firm's strategic, uh, the strategic direction uh, relative to the big four were two. Um, and it's pretty, comes from a pretty simple question. And that is, what kind of legal work do you do and where do you do it? So if you look at the uh, geographic presence, we think that that is fairly important and the sophistication of the type of legal work that they do. 
So the proxy we used for where they did it was simple. Uh, the number of countries in which a firm operates was a useful measure we found. Uh, and it, it measured essentially the proximity to competition from the big four accounting firms. The proxy for sophistication was average revenue per lawyer. This is a little bit more uh, contentious for a number of reasons, but the fundamental premise is that clients will pay for value and that can be measured fairly easily in a revenue per lawyer measurement. Now, when you have a uh, discussion with a client or with a uh, partner, um, this is a tough uh, dis discussion to have because everybody thinks they do the most sophisticated work. Um, However, higher RPL generally indicates more of the bet the business work and the lower RPL generates a run the business work. All of that very good work, but that's a way to really segment it. Now we understand again, it's not a perfect measure because in different geographic areas, you find that revenue per lawyer is markedly different, but uh, if you look on a global basis and you look at firms with higher RPLs, uh, you find that they have a lot in common and, and you would recognize that if you looked at the names of those firms. So here's what we did. We plotted on the vertical axis, the revenue per lawyer, and on the horizontal axis, the number of countries that that firm had an office in. So let me just point out uh, on the top left at $2 million, you can see Wachtell Lipton and actually Wachtell for 2020 had an RPL higher than that. It was closer to three and a half million, but I didn't want to stretch the chart that far because it would take the others out of context. And they of course have one office. Uh, and down to the far uh, right and the bottom, you see Denton's with nearly 80 countries that they're in and revenue per lawyer at probably about 260,000. And the rest of those um, 98 dots are all the other firms and, and where they fall. So this was the strategic playing field that we mapped out and we said, can we take the strategic plan and reaction and relate it to this chart? So what we found was 70% of the firms that I interviewed decided to make no change. And of that 70%, there's a subset that says the threat was not perceived or not even investigated. And that was 30% of the firms. And then the other 40% did their assessment and they dismissed the big four as basically not being uh, threatening to their business. And here's where those firms wound up on this strategic map. 85% of the firms that are operating in 10 countries or less are represented over by that oval. So that means that 15% of the um, uh, firms uh, who operate in more than 10 countries are um, doing no change, but 85% clearly are within this oval. So I thought it was, interesting to give you a little bit of a flavor of their thinking from some of the comments I got from these firms. So strategy 1A, this is, we don't know that much about it. We haven't done a thorough analysis. Here were their comments. Our awareness is one inch deep. We have a moat around our castle via the ABA. Most of our lawyers have the heads, their heads in the sand. We have only one lawyer that believes that there are barbarians at the gate. If we don't find a way to deliver it, at the efficiency levels that the big four do, it won't matter if we're a bet the company firm. Most innovative thinking is coming from non-lawyers in our innovation centers. A lack of higher level relationships beyond the legal department is huge and the big four will have the inside track. And if you don't have a good relationship with a line of business executives, you're going to lose. They, meaning the big four, have complete picture of the problem and legal is just one area. This is a huge advantage over law firms. They're in the boardrooms and I wish we had more relationships like this. So from the comments of these firms, you can see that there's a lot of hesitancy about making no change and not standing still. When you look at the firms that have done the analysis 
and made a determination that no change was necessary, they found a little bit more uh, confident in their position. I think the big four are not true competitors to us. We don't spend much time thinking about the big four. Clients are very discerning on who they hire and they wouldn't hire us to do PwC work and vice versa. They acknowledge that the big four have good boardroom access, but curiously, um, they said that's becoming less important in the post-financial crisis. If I was doing a lot of commodity work, I'd be worried. We're not doing much to compete with the big four. We've lost some work. It's not a strategic issue, but we're moving up market. So we shouldn't see competition from them. Our biggest threats are high quality law firms and the big four are just around the edges of our business. Our managing partner talks about this most of anyone and raises the topic regularly. <clears throat> uh, we don't hear much from partners or practice management, so that translates to a very low com uh, competitive concern and our focus is competing with peer law firms. So they're fairly confident a little bit more than the firms that haven't done the analysis. So let's move on to number two. And these are the firms who are pursuing a complementary relationship with the big four to work on client engagements. And this was 15% of the firms interviewed. And when you map them on the strategic playing field, what you see is 100% of the firms I spoke to who are pursuing the complementary strategy have revenue over 975,000, which by the way is the uh, average of the uh, global 100 for 2020. So they have uh, revenue higher than the average and in greater than 10 countries. So it was very clear where they see their positioning in the marketplace and they feel very comfortable bringing in the big four to work with them on client engagements. Here are some of their comments. We're taking a general contractor approach and the big four are just one of our subs. We're not gonna build a large in-house team to provide all the talent. We'll bring others in when we need them. Technology, industry ex experts, due diligence, et cetera. We really don't view the big four as direct competitors, rather additional resources we can bring to the client. The big four are worried about not having a good relationship with the GC and we can remedy that deficiency. We have very complementary relationships and the accounting firms have been generous with their knowledge, especially in the technology area. The type of work they do has not threatened us, at least in the United States. <clears throat> firms in the AMLAW 50 to 200 need to be worried about other ALSPs that will be very competitive. So now we go to the third strategy and that is we understand the threat and we're gonna transform our law firm to a multi-professional integrated solutions model to include new services and professionals beyond the typical law practice. So this is a big transformation of a firm because it goes just beyond the work you're doing. It goes to the culture of the firm and transformation of everything in the firm, including incentives. That was 15% of the firms that were interviewed. And let me explain just for a moment, some of the characteristics of this new business model. This is where one per firm provides all the professional services talent for a deal and they bring in all the experts um, that they need to, accounting, legal, finance, data, data analytics, and of course, lawyers. It's fairly new to law firms, uh, very mature with consultancies and right now being expanded by the accounting firms, including their addition of, uh, as I said earlier, 10,000 licensed attorneys. Law becomes just an additional expertise in this model and providing integrated teams. And oftentimes uh, the amount of time a lawyer spends on one of these deals is maybe 15% or less of the team. And as this model grows, it's gonna provide additional career options for lawyers because just beyond what we see now in uh, legal departments or uh, outside counsel and law firms, uh, the accounting networks and consultancies will also be career opportunities for them. And here's where they fit on the strategic chart. Again, 100% of the firms I interviewed pursuing this, this strategy have what we call run the business type of work. And all of them had, uh, 
offices in more than 10 countries. So here's our comments from strategy three firms. The law firms are no longer the first people to be called when there's a big deal or a problem. Big law is losing market share of the big four. We need partners that are not lawyers to compete. This is where the money is. We can go on holiday and still make money. There's a much higher leverage in this business. We are applying for, for an ABS in the UK and will be able to give equity to professionals that are not lawyers. Our client contact points broaden beyond the chief legal officer to include business unit and risk management executives, including the COO and CEO. Law firms who partner with the big four risk losing the relationship. We now have access to new buyers, operations, lines of business. You and the US firms need to realign their incentives to encourage, encourage larger teams. And this last one I thought was very important. In the US, the ABA is not doing law firms any favors with rule 5.4 because they're not learning how to compete with integrated solutions being offered by the big four and other consultancies. It's good for short-term profits, but bad for long-term competitiveness. Now, when I look at the comments from firms of all three strategies, I will tell you that this group is probably the most confidence confident in their strategy than uh, certainly the first and probably the second group as well. So here's where they landed, uh, clearly differentiated by this strategic playing field map that I've put together here. And there's one additional, additional segment though that I wanted to point out. And again, I think this is pretty important. This is a subset of strategy one. These are people who are expanding into some integrated solutions with multidisciplinary uh, professionals, but they are doing it because they saw a market opportunity, they saw the client need, and it actually had zero to do with the big four. Some of their comments are, we're bringing in non-lawyers, we're building a network of thought leaders outside the firm as complementary resources, but the intent is to eventually have all these resources within the firm. We're doing this as a response to client need rather than competitive forces. We'll build new client relationships in the C-suite and within the lines of business, it'll be a global effort without any geographic focus. And we're building consulting practice that complement our legal practices because we can help the clients not due to big four competitive, competitive pressures. These are areas where the client starts with lawyers, not, con not consultants. We'll build complementary relationships and work with the big four when necessary. So that again is a very important segment. And I think it's very important because they're reacting directly to client need and market opportunity that, that they see. So many firms have clearly thought through their position and taking meaningful actions to broaden their value proposition and counter new competition, but also many have not addressed their marketplace. And in that first group, you can see the responses they had and the comments they made. They felt very uneasy and somewhat nervous about maybe not doing a little bit more than they were. The new delivery models are, and touch points uh, provide new career opportunities for lawyers, especially young lawyers, which is something that I think uh, needs further investigation. Now, some of the implications of these changes are, th are this. New questions to be explored. And these are some things I'd like to discuss with a panel here in a few minutes. What type of professionals are actually leading these strategies in the law firms? And how do these strategic choices among the elite global firm influence the responses of smaller and more regional firms? How should we think about international exposure and its impact on strategy and what new career opportunities will exist for lawyers as this approach expands? Some of the on the ground, I call it on the ground operational impacts because it's, it's very tactical and it's today. It's the early mover advantage versus a strategy of active waiting. Um, that always is hotly debated. Sometimes people think if you get there earlier, you'll win. Other times people say, let someone else do the hard work and we'll come in once the model is proved. There also is uh, 
a few of the uh, strategy three people indicated a risk of subverting the primary client relationship uh, by bringing in some new strategic partners. And if you're going to transform your, your firm, that's a, a fairly high task, a big task, and there's cul cultural operational effort in making that transformation. So that concludes my comments and my presentation. And now what I'd like to do, David, is go to the panel and discuss some of the impl implications of what we've seen today. Thank you, Bob. I, I hope uh, you and the audience could see why we are always uh, so excited to collaborate with Bob because he has, I think, a, a way of really kind of stepping back and framing issues that we're all kind of living with in the moment and just providing a very simple heuristic to try to understand how the developments may be shaking out and where they are going in the future. Uh, but the proof, Bob, is in the pudding and the pudding is going to be tasted by four amazing panelists who have agreed uh, to come together with us uh, to discuss these issues. Three are from the law firm world, and one is from the most important world, which is the world of the client, who I again repeat over and over again, are going to be the ones who are going to determine how this ecosystem develops. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and as I do, uh, I'd like you to kind of turn on your uh, videos and uh, wave to the adoring crowd, say hello, uh, and then we'll get into uh, a discussion. And some of you in the audience, let me repeat, are already uh, sending us questions which uh, are coming up on my private chat, uh, which we're screening and we will uh, use as part of the discussion. But Joe, you're always so eager. You want to be a part of the discussion. He jumped the gun. He was supposed to turn it on after I introduced him, but you want to see his face as much as possible. This is Joe Andrew. He is the global chair of Denton's, uh, one of the most interesting and innovative law firms in the world for anybody who has the privilege of studying the legal profession and one that I've had a long relationship with. So Joe, thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, next, we have uh, Megan Kelly, uh, who has coming to us from White and Case, where she's the, currently the global director of strategy, uh, but where, as you heard before, uh, she uh, came from the other team. And so we're going to, she has a unique insight about what the relationship between the big four and law firms are. And we just had the great pleasure of having uh, Megan in one of our executive programs where she was a superstar, I can tell you. Um, third, uh, we have Graham Richardson, uh, who's the partner, but also as again, you heard the head of Connexo, uh, which is one of the most innovative responses to what's happening out there in the marketplace in one of the most interesting firms, Evershed Sutherland. I actually had the privilege of knowing both parts of that firm and actually teaching the managing partners of both of those firms before they came together. So if it's a success, give me credit. If not, let's talk later. Um, and finally, and certainly not least, we have uh, Tracy Yurko, uh, who is the uh, general counsel and uh, corporate secretary at Bridgewater, as you all know, one of the most important players in the financial ecosystem in the world. I've had the pleasure of interacting with Tracy in a few different contexts in our exec ed strategy, as well as our research on innovation. And I promise you, she's one of the most thoughtful, innovative, and creative general counsels today. In fact, she was just recognized, I think, in a wonderful award that was given to her as being kind of one of the leading voices in the GC market today. So uh, let's get right to it. And Joe, I want to start with you because your dot was identified. Uh, and, you know, you guys, as I said, you are the largest law firm in the world now, uh, Denton's Dashel. Uh, and as a result, you are more exposed than anybody to the big four who partly their selling point is we are more global than any law firm or frankly, any other kind of professional service firm, frankly, in the world. So I wonder how you react to Bob's talk and maybe if you could say a few words uh, about how you see these issues from the perspective of Denton's. Well, David, first off, thank you for uh, your and your colleagues uh, at Harvard, and then also thank you, Bob, for this uh, great work. 
Uh, it's really important, I think, that uh, what you do, uh, which talks about how the profession uh, impacts the business and how the business impacts the profession, is something that we all spend some time with. That's a little bit how justice is made, is right, when business uh, affects the uh, profession. So let me make uh, three comments and then a footnote about Bob's uh, research, which again, I find uh, truly superb. Uh, and I'll try to do these in, in ascending order from, from minor to, to more important. Um, you know, first off, I think this is a good news that law firms in the big four consulting accounting firms are all competing with each other. It's good news, not just because competition leads to better quality work, uh, but also because of the fact that for most of us, including those that are in the rarefied air of just being a Wall Street firm, we all recognize that these big firms are first, usually our clients. So if you look at Dentons, for example, the big four accounting firms are in our top 50 clients. They're in our top four. So four big accounting firms are the top four referral sources to Dentons in the world. Uh, so that's, we talk about uh, just whether we choose or don't choose to recognize the impact of what they do. There are clients, there are collaborators, there are referral sources. I think it's also important to recognize that they have a tremendous impact on what we do. Uh, you know, someone or something can have an impact and not be a competitor. So I'm always amazed when law firm leaders say that the big four accounting firms don't have an impact on what they're doing. I think if they do so, and Tracy can probably speak to this, that means they think of the boardroom as I've got a good relationship with the general counsel. They don't recognize that general counsels are, of course, dealing with CFOs and CEOs and the SVP for M&A. And that, that ecosystem of the boardroom, which I spend a lot of my time in, is a complex place. And obviously, these big accounting firms have a major role in providing a set of services, making referrals to law firms, in turn referrals from law firms to them, and obviously you know, being everybody's client and support service. So that's point number one. Point number two, of course, it's important to recognize it's not just the big four accounting firms that have moved into legal service. So let me just you know, run down a little list here. Grant Thornton in the legal business, BDO through BDO Legal in the legal service, RSM providing legal services, Crowell Global providing legal services, Baker Tilly, providing legal services. And let me particularly talk about uh, our friends at Anderson Global, who are providing the only place that is providing legal services in as many places as PwC or Dentons in the world is and Anderson Global. And Anderson Global, in fact, just in the past two years, uh, has 44 offices in Africa, for example, and they're providing legal services in 41 of them. Uh, more than 30% of all of us Anderson Global's personnel in Latin America have a law degree, right? So again, uh, statistically from our research, we know that while our European colleagues clearly believe uh, that competitive competition from what are perceived as accounting and consulting firms is biggest, statistically it, it, that is small compared to Latin America and the Caribbean, small compared to Africa, small compared to the Asian countries and small uh, compared to Austro-Asia countries as well, with Latin America significantly having larger deals, bigger transactions and bigger disputes served by uh, a legal service that is part of an accounting or a consulting firm as well. So it's everywhere. And again, when you say there's no impact, I think that's frankly a lot because you've got kind of just a U.S. perspective. Uh, you're thinking of things just as a U.S. lawyer, thinking about U.S. competition, not thinking about a global competition. But third and most importantly, before I drop to that quick footnote here, and I apologize if I'm taking too long, What's most important is the strategy, not just of the big four accounting firms, but the strategy of the biggest advertising agencies in the world, the biggest engineering companies, the biggest architecture firms, all professional services other than law firms are all pursuing the exact same strategy, which is to have personal relationships with decision makers wherever they might be. So when people talk about how Dentons is chasing the uh, big four strategy in the United States, we're chasing the same strategy that uh, the big advertising and big architecture and big engineering firms and every professional service is. We want to have someone who has a personal relationship with a CEO, a CFO, a general counsel in Indianapolis, Indiana. We don't have to have all of the services we provide. For so example, in Indiana, I don't believe there's a single chambers qualified uh, antitrust lawyer in the whole state. I happen to be from Indiana. There's no antitrust lawyers. So if you have an antitrust problem in Indiana, which has, I believe, uh, of the Russell 3000 has 43 companies. The Russell 3000 company has an outside legal spend of a minimum of $25 million. So these are big companies. So 43 of them are Indiana. A whole bunch of them have antitrust problems. 
So you want to have that personal relationship with somebody whose kids go to the same school, they've met on the side of the soccer field, they go to the same church or synagogue or mosque, they're involved in the same not-for-profits, and you therefore can steer that person to expertise that you have somewhere else. Or if they're an international company, like there are uh, exactly 1,113 international companies in the state of Indiana, you can follow them to wherever they may be, anywhere in the globe. That's what engineering firms do. That's what architecture firms do. That's what the big accounting firms do. That's what McKinsey does and uh, Boston Consulting does, right? So it's literally only law firms that have this mom and pop operations that are very tiny that somehow don't get the way that you can actually expand to provide better quality service. And we don't even have to get to the fact that you have better processing, you use artificial intelligence, that you have a more sophisticated way about providing the service, which again, all of those big organizations have because of the economies of scale, whether they're accounting firm or not. So quick footnote and then I'll stop. The challenge with the RPA, RPL distinction that Bob has made, and Bob and I've had conversations about this, is not that I think he's wrong about the categories. I think he's actually right. But the challenge is, is that what it misunderstands is the fact that, for example, in Manhattan, we are uh, essentially the Thatcher profit, the old white shoe Wall Street firm that invented capital markets and securitization as we know it. Our RPL, therefore, in New York is a just similar like any other Wall Street firm would be, right? We're also the largest and biggest firm in Papua New Guinea. Now, I can guarantee you that because I have to average under what Bob's doing, the revenue per lawyer between the only chambers rated firm in Papua New Guinea and a Wall Street firm in Manhattan, that obviously makes that RPL a little bit different. So I think that it's really about size and size of office and global expanse uh, that is really the distinction here that is important, not the revenue per lawyer number, which again has got a very U.S. focus and U.S. kind of blinders on because that's only about the money centers around the world that would have an RPL. Uh, believe me, in places that where we have the highest RPL, so uh, I will tell you that, for example, where we will have a lower RPL in 76 of our uh, more than 80 some offices than we do in Manhattan, but in many of those, we're doing much more sophisticated work, much more bet the company work than we would be doing in Manhattan, where we have significant competition from, as you'll hear from my great colleagues of White and Casey, right, who do a fantastic job. But we would be the equivalent of what they're doing in a place like Bogota, Colombia, recognizing that we're going to have a much lower RPL. That's a footnote to what I think is excellent work that Bob is doing. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Joe. And uh, that was a passionate uh, argument that size matters from a guy from the, who just treated Bob Couture as if he were the Zags and he were Baylor, speaking of Indiana, anyway. Uh, Megan, uh, you really do have a unique perspective for this. Uh, I, I give my friend Hugh Verrier a lot of credit from poaching in the opposite direction, shall we say, of bringing uh, you to be his kind of global head of strategy, but White and Case is also a very, uh, a global firm of the kind of traditional New York firms, maybe among the most uh, global. And I wonder how you see uh, this perspective of, of Bob's research and these issues. Well, when I first talked to Bob about the research, one, I was so excited someone was doing it. Because as Bob had mentioned, it's so hard to get some of this information and details. And I am coming from a unique perspective, but I definitely wanted to better understand how does this data all come together? And there was one comment that was made in group 1C, which is we're not necessarily responding to the big four, we're responding to our clients. And I would say that's exactly where we're fitting in, which is we're seeing client needs really start to shift and change. And you know, what I've seen in the work that I've done over the last you know, couple of decades is the expectations of what do clients need and want from their service providers, whether that be the big four or big law. And so when, if you look at in-house, you've seen finance transformation, HR transformation, tax department transformation. And for such a long time, the legal department was really kind of saved from this transformation because I heard a number of GCs would say, well, if you can't tell me how much I'm gonna litigate, and if you can't tell me how many transactions we're gonna do, it's kind of hard for me to talk about cost reduction strategies and all of that. And Tracy can speak to this better than I can, 
But I think the shift in expectations and the pressures that are being put on the GC are really opening the door to many different types of providers to come in and work side by side with, with the GCs. So I, I was really fascinated by a lot of the comments where you're starting to pick up things around efficiency, innovation. And I think those expectations are moving from, you know, to the, the law firms. And so we're looking to say, okay, well, how do I not only meet, but stay ahead of what my client's expectations are. And when you get above that 10 office threshold, that's where you start to see the, well, how do you scale? Because there's a cost and benefit. And that's where I think it goes from the external point of view of what does the client need? What does the client want to the internal of, well, how do I bring in that talent? Or does it make sense for me to bring in that talent or to partner? And so I've always seen a great synergy between the big four and big law saying we can certainly partner to bring even better experience to clients. So fascinated by the research and really excited about the panel. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Graham, when I first met you, you were just a partner at a law firm. Now you're like a CEO <laughs> of a whole giant uh, enterprise here and one that has been sent out on the front lines at least as I look at it, to directly compete with some of the offerings that the big four are offering. And so again, I think you are in a very unique position having come from being a partner in a law firm now to being really in charge of this increasingly important part of Evershed Sutherland's overall strategy. I wonder how you see uh, Bob's positioning and research in the market in general. Thank you, David, and, and hi everyone. Um, I guess I'm living proof almost that Bob is on the right track. So uh, I, I can certainly um, you know, confirm some of his findings and thoughts and, and the process there. So yes, I was a partner in a law firm, uh, still am, um, which is an interesting thing straddling both, but I lead um, Connexo, which is an alternative legal service provider. And I guess to sort of prove some of the comments Bob's made, you know, Evershed Sutherland has 69 offices in 32 countries, so it's global in, in, in a law firm language. And we are in that lower um, billing rate, lower revenue rate, so we, we tick those boxes. I think also, interestingly, which I, I, you know, my role is looking at things globally, and we're a global law firm, but I do sit in Europe. I sit in England and Wales, that's my jurisdiction, and it is a heavily deregulated market with alternative business structures with lots of competition. And I think that does give a different perspective from where we're sitting as you know, a deregulated market um, with lots of operations in lots of different countries. That does give us that perspective and, and I suppose why we're more focused perhaps than some of our US um, colleagues on, on the big four. I suppose to give a little bit of the history of Connexo, which I think is also relevant, um, one, we started calling it Evershed Sutherland or Evershed's Consulting originally back in 2011. And to echo what Megan said, why, why did we actually launch Evershed's Consulting? It was in a very difficult market in 2011 when we launched it after the global financial crisis to try and differentiate our law firm versus many of the others out there. You know, for, for those of you who lived through that, and, and I did, too many lawyers and not enough work. So you have to differentiate yourself. And I think what we were trying to do is broaden the range of services we had, to Megan's point, more services to help out general counsel who had risen in number and power. So having a broader range of services was one of the key drivers for, for the originator of, of Connect. So I think also um, we did try and compete with, to, to your point, David, it was there to try and compete with the big four to push them back in some of the areas where we thought we could you know do well and compete and also go and attack some of their areas and, and particularly where we found success is financial crime uh, remediation projects the, the real territory of the big four and, and they have proved big revenue winners for us uh, and my final point just to uh, which resonated for me in bob's uh, research was i think he um talked about um you know, what, what the subverting of the main law firm and many law firms being worried about you know, looking at broadening its services and bringing in other professionals as, from that subversion point. And we recognize that as well. And one of the reasons we launched the Connexo 
brand in 2019 was was to deal with that subverting point and to reassure our partners and our clients that Connexo was something slightly different and it could be recognised as something slightly different to the main law firm. But but I, you know but definitely recognising that I suppose tension and fear amongst some of our partners that well Graham what are you offering isn't that subverting our brand as Evershed Sutherland a law firm looking to move top right to higher and more strategic work how will clients view that and so we really did recognize that that point and it was you know if you were to ask my partners in the main law firm they would say yeah we need to make sure we don't you know affect all the good work we're trying to do in moving into higher and more strategic work by launching a, an effective and alternative legal service provider from within so a lot of the research resonated for me. Uh, I would say one of the crucial things is I, because I sit in a deregulated legal market, probably has more resonate resonation and resonation for me than than guys who are sat in more more um, shielded markets. And I guess my one sort of thought, or two two thoughts really to 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 leave with are: how would you feel if the ABA suddenly let the barriers down? Would that be a scary place to be? Because I always I've always learned as a lawyer, which was my original, you know, role, the worst things, think about them and plan for them because they can often happen. So how would that make you feel? And the other thing I always used to think about and discuss with my uh, former uh, CEO of our business, Brian Hughes, was how would you feel if you opened up your emails one morning and there was a news feed saying top 10 global law firm merges with Deloitte's PwC or however you want? How would you feel then? would you then feel our strategy is fine and if the answer is yes then that's fine but i think those are two interesting things to have a think about um but yeah great to be here and uh, and thank you for the opportunity well as always brian was very prescient and uh, we will have a think about the regulatory stuff and i will just throw out mm -hmm. there that both strat things that brian uh asked you to think about are going to happen i'd say within the next five years that's my prediction yep. uh and uh that's why this is such an interesting topic and that is why we have saved for our cleanup hitter as long as we're in the sporting world analogy we went from the ncaa's to the opening day of baseball uh to the person whose voice will matter the most and the person within that category i desperately wanted to join us was Tracy Yurko. Uh, and it is because she already sits within one of the most innovative, data-driven, globalized uh, companies in the world uh, that is driving as much as any single player is uh, the work of all the firms that are involved here, and all of them would love to have her as a client, I am sure. Uh, and yet she's doing it uh, in the context of a very interesting place. One, she has a very small department, very lean, so she has to really figure out how to use those resources. And two, as Tracy, you know, speaking of the big four, we just completed, meaning the Center on the Legal Profession, just completed a giant survey of a thousand general counsels around the world, plus a thousand contracting professionals, all since uh, January 1, only something that the big four has the scale, quite frankly, to do, in which they identified the coming period as one in which legal departments are going to be both facing an incredibly incre increased workload around managing growth and risk in this kind of post-COVID environment, and that they are likely to be asked to do that with no growth in resources and maybe fewer resources. So how are you thinking about this combination as you look around at the ecosystem of providers seeking to serve Bridgewater and help you with this challenge? Um, great. Well, first, David and Bob and my other panelists, I just want to thank everyone for being here and being people um, who are helping to think about these problems that David's raising, because it is, um, it's something I have on my mind. Um, quite a bit and, um, and, and happy for these innovative minds because I think that we as a profession, um, you know, are on the precipice of a potential transformation. Um, and, you know, 
J Joe touched on this, but as an in-house department, um, we really, we have such a broad remit and it's not just from a subject matter expertise, but from a, the complexity of the work. And so we do need, um, we need different solutions. We need solutions at different price points. Um, we need help with technology because we are not law firms, right? We're legal departments inside of other companies. And so we're really looking for, you know, from partnership, from a variety of different, different places. And, um, as you said, David, we, um, you know, we want to do these things in a cost efficient way. We want to be able to flex and scale when we need to, as the, you know, as the demands rise. And so it's something that, that we have looked at as a department and have already started to do sort of our own transformation and looking for ways to partner with the big four um, and other providers so that we have the technology um, that will allow us to do the things that we want to do um, as a department on a going forward basis, that we have the resources. Um, and I think there's an evolving role of in-house lawyers. Um, at, the, at the same time that you're seeing these changes that David described, you're always also seeing our clients internally, and people are writing about this in the profession, where your in-house lawyers, we want, um, you know, our internal clients want strategic thought partners. You know, they want people to really help them with this high complexity work. And certainly we rely on our outside law firms. Um, there's sort of no substitute uh, for that kind of high strategic value work. But I looked at my department and I said, how can we meet, how can we meet the needs of our internal clients and have our internal lawyers freed up to really be those strategic partners? Um, how can we develop our people? And that's a, that's a thing that, um, that I'm very focused on, that my company's very focused on, which is how do I get the most out of our internal professionals and how do they get the most out of their job? And so, you know, the solution, you know, one of the solutions at least that we've looked at is really identifying that layer of work that is high volume and low complexity work and relying on some outside providers to help us with the technology, to make it cost efficient, and to make it just efficient on its own so that now we've got, as you said, a lean team of high professionals who are spending as much of their time as possible doing this kind of strategic work, which I think is a, really a win-win all around for us. So Tracy, I'm sure there, we're going to come back to that. There are a lot of interesting questions in the chat. I'm just going to kind of summarize these and I'll, I'll start... Uh, Maybe with you, Joe, because you made the point, listen, you're, it's an incredibly complex organization, which is very different in, you know, the old Thatcher prophet in New York and Papua New Guinea, and you didn't even mention, you know, uh, Chongqing and lots of other places where you are. Um, what kinds of practices do you see most being impacted uh, by the big four's entry? And as kind of a related question people ask, how do you manage the tension between those people who are saying the house is burning, we got to get in here and figure out how to compete with these people, and those people who are sitting off someplace where you say, what are you talking about? Those are a bunch of bean counters. We don't think about these people at all. How do you manage that kind of tension between these different parts of your organization, and where do you see the threat? Sure. Well, uh... Of course, the answer is we listen to our clients, uh, as Tracy would probably expect me to say. But, but I do think that, that Tracy made a really important uh, comment that can help answer that question. So as we come out of a global pandemic and a global economic crisis, uh, if you do a quick survey of every business publication, of every business television show anywhere in the world, everyone's trying to answer the question, well, what's next? They're all looking for thought leadership on this. And our research and our conversations say, that general counsels have become exceptionally more important from a strategic standpoint in every company in the world. Because when you think about what's next, I've got to change my strategy, my supply chains, whatever it might be, the general counsel becomes the key figure in all of those conversations. I think that's particularly true of big financial institutions, but it's true all across the globe. So GCs are being asked to do more and they're being asked to answer much broader and bigger questions, as well as 
you know, who's the right lawyer to do X litigation in X place? And those big, broader questions mean that the lived experience of a general counsel is different and therefore, they're looking a lot broader for bigger and better strategic assistance. So in places that might not have had this question before, suddenly they have it. So we've got, just to give you some sense, so we have 204 offices around the globe, more than 12,000 lawyers. But we also have more than 2,000 people who are not acting as lawyers, but are providing consulting services. 2,000. So that's uh, bigger than some of those other consulting firms that I just identified, though obviously pales in comparison to the size of, uh, of the big four. And that's the, the future for all of us, regardless if we have 12,000 lawyers and more than 2,000 consultants, uh, or, the, or 12 and two, is, is that you're finding that the general counsels are asking, are being asked by their internal clients to answer much bigger, much more complex, and much broader questions. So we see this change around the globe. We see that obviously while people on Wall Street may not have thought about it the same way they do, again, anyplace else around the globe, uh, that they're beginning to get those questions. Now in developing markets, you know, of our, uh, we're the biggest law firm now in Africa, we're the biggest law firm in Latin America, the only pan-Latin American or pan-African firm, those kind of places to say nothing, as, as you noted, that we have 44 offices in China, um, those, they've always been dealing with those issues. They've always been competing with these big consulting firms. So this is not new to them. As Graham really rightly said, particularly if you've got a European kind of viewpoint on this, you've, you've always seen in a deregulated market, if you've got competition. What's new is because the GCs are being asked bigger and broader questions. Now you've got people in places that are money centers, New York, Singapore, Northern California, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frankfurt, right? London, uh, downtown. Those are the kinds of uh, people that are asking these new questions that everybody else already understood. So Graham, uh, that's a great segue to where a number of other questions were because it's built on something that uh, you said was a challenge for you, quite frankly, in setting this up and getting buy-in from the firm. Now, Joe very cleverly uh, spun all the consulting that they're doing as answering the big high-end questions that are about global strategy. Everybody wants that. Yeah, but you run a kind of managed service e-discovery business. That's not that. And how have you managed the brand challenge that many of your partners undoubtedly, you said, expressed around trying to put together these different kinds of services, which Tracy just told you she needs and wants. Yeah, yeah. It's in. I think um, you know one of a general conference. That's I think the legal ecosystem to use that phrase, whether you hate it or like it, it is much we more. Love it. Yeah, we <laughs> we kind of embedded it, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> there. Um, the uh, it's a much more complicated legal ecosystem than it was. You know, go back twenty years ago. You know, I've, I've been in this business. You know, twenty thirty years now. You know just the rise of the general counsel is one thing. It's a very complicated ecosystem out there with people like Tracy and other, having to navigate their way around it. You know, they know they need a diverse a number of supplies, but which ones do they choose? So, so I guess when you come to then a law firm, you're thinking, well, what does this law firm actually do? Are they aiming for high-end work? Are they aiming for commodity? Are they a mixture of everything to everyone? And I also, I also think clients get frustrated sometimes when they say, what do you do? Well, you tell us a problem, we'll solve it for you. You know, you do need to state what you actually stand for and what you're trying to uh, c c communicate to the market. And it's quite, you know, there was definitely a tension for my partners, which led to the rebranding. And interestingly, this is my view, but I think probably most of my partners agree. Our clients got it a lot faster than the, the partners in the firm clients got it they went right graham and his guys are offering that service if i want my high-end bet the ranch work done i'll go to firm a or the guys in the m a team in london at the so they got it i think it was more the rebranding for connexo was actually more beneficial internally where my and it gave my partners a greater confidence to talk to clients about my services and what we did in, in the ALSP world. And so I think that was where the big, ben I think the clients got it early, much quicker than the, the partners. Did. So that because the partners were scared to get into a conversation with a client saying, yeah, well, actually we do want this high end piece of work from you, but also 
what about some commodity work or what about some con uh, compliance consulting work? And they'd end up in a conversation they felt uncomfortable with and feeling that the client was sort of saying, well, what, you know, what do you actually stand for? And they didn't want to get into that discussion. So it's actually really helped more internally for our um, partners and firm to understand what do we do and what do we stand for. Um, and it's definitely helped my engagement with clients. And then, you know, I always say, um, what's the best way to sell the services of Connexo? My sales force is the 600 partners in Evershed Sutherland, getting them to understand what we do, who've got the trusted relationships and then talk to um, their clients where, you know, they're, they're already in that place of trusted advisor. That, that's, you know, that's the key for me building my business. So it, it was um, interesting, more an internal thing, I guess. Externally, yeah, it's been good and it's great, but I think more important to, if that helps answer the question, Dave. It absolutely does. And it's also a, a segue to where I want to ask Megan, because Megan gave us in this wonderful way, a kind of kumbaya song that we're all just going to get together and, you know, it'll be mutually reinforcing. And of course, you would expect somebody to say that who came over from the other side. But the question is, is she a double agent in some way or another, or to maybe put the regulatory question that many people have asked, and that uh, Graham put on the table and I sort of pushed. Um, you know, do we think uh, the regulatory restrictions are probably going to be eased? I will just tell you there was a proposal for multidisciplinary practice that got all the way to the House of Delegates at the ABA before being voted down. And if it was, is it more likely that White and Case will buy PwC or PwC buy White and Case. Slightly a joke, but how do you think about a world in which the protection or the moat, as Bob's discussion said, uh, his bridges are being built over the moat? Well, you know, and I, I should mention too, I've, I've worked both in London and in the US, so I'm very familiar with the market that Graham's talking about, which is deregulated, which I think did open the door for many more big four to get in the second largest legal market in the world. So I think that was a game changer with the ABS license and what the SRA did. I, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, if we woke up tomorrow and what would we do? To be honest, we haven't had that type of conversation, but what I can say, you know, is a couple of different things. When you look at the big four, most of them have large audit, tax, consulting businesses, and legal. So legal is a piece of a much bigger puzzle, whereas most big law, you've got mostly law and then some of these other services. So when you think about merging together, you're talking about Tons of things that any M&A lawyer would look at it and say, wow, you're talking about culture merger as well. And so I think there's a lot of talent questions and implications that really come into play that I'd want to dive much more deeply into before I spoke about that. But I, I do think that when I look at things strategically, I do think there's the talent implications of, you know, very different cultures between big four and, and big law, very different career paths as well. And I know one of the challenges that both on the big four and big law is what is the career opportunity that I can offer to talent coming in to a non-traditional role in either of these you know, large global corporations. So I, I do think as much as we'd want to sit and say, well, we need this talent, we'll just go get it. It has to be a very compelling proposition for them to come over. And I know from my own personal standpoint, I took a step back and said, okay, well, what will this offer me in my career that I can't you know, necessarily get? And so getting access to you know, different ways of thinking, I really wanted to better understand the lawyers and the legal mindset. So it offered me something very compelling, you know, to move and expand my own skill set. So I think a lot of my move from big four to big law was very personally motivated to get a deeper understanding of my clients. And so when you look at it, I do, I do think that there's a big talent question that we maybe haven't touched on as much. And, you know, as Tracy's already pointed out, how is she training you know, those in her legal department, what additional skills do you need? And I always say, if you look at the profile of a typical consulting firm and a typical law firm, if you do Myers-Briggs or any of those personality tests, very different personalities. And so just to say, well, look, you need, you need project management. I'm going to go teach that to you. Some will pick it up. Some will not pick it up. And so I, I do think there's a lot of, you know, 
when you look at the change management and a lot of the other barriers that may be to just saying, okay, we're going to have this service tomorrow. I don't think it's as, as simple as maybe, you know, we talk about it sometimes. So that Megan, as always is a perfect segue for where I wanted to go to Tracy. And another reason why I wanted Tracy so much on this panel is that I know that she is an organization that is absolutely committed to radical transparency. So anything I ask her, she absolutely has to give the most honest answer to. Uh, and Megan is raising, I think, a question that has come up a lot in the chat. And it has something to do with talent, both internally and externally. So Tracy, maybe if you could think a little bit about Megan asked it to you about how are you training your lawyers, but you could turn it around and say, what are you looking for in these uh, external providers? And is there a way uh, in which you think some organizations are going to be better at giving you what you want? And that might make you say more skeptical about law firms trying to move in one area or big four trying to move in another. And then let me just one more turn of the wheel uh, because you live in an organization, as all general counsels do, in which you also have bosses, and those are the business leaders. And those business leaders, as we found out, also have relationships with lots of different kinds of people in the ecosystem out there, including the big four, but not limited to them. And so I wonder if you're also getting that from the other side saying, hey, why aren't you using these people? We use these people all the time and they would interface very well with what we're doing in this other part of the business. So talk a little bit about the kind of talent issues, 360 that you are dealing with. And be honest. No, I know you will be. <laughs> I mean, well, first of all, I will say, you know, we um, we certainly rely on the law firms to do the do the training um, for the lawyers that we hire. Um, and I've always been I probably convenient theory for me since I'm a product of it. But I've always be, you know believed in um, the type of training that that lawyers get at law firms. And so we don't typically hire very junior people. We look for people that, you know, have already gotten some of that some of that training for law firms. I do think, and this is sort of a side question, I do think there's an interesting discussion around how will that training evolve at law firms um, with, you know, with advances in technology, with the ways that, um, that the profession is, is changing and evolving. Um, but I think it's, it starts there for us, uh, which is I sort of, I, I know what, what I'm getting mostly when I hire from particular law firms and people have a certain practice area, a certain, you know, certain number of years of experience. Um, the, the, the big shift that I do see um, for lawyers as they come from sort of a law firm environment into an in-house environment um, is really needing to become business-minded um, to bring in some really sort of everyday, you know, practically speaking. And one of the things that gets pushed particularly at Bridgewater, and part of that I think is, you know, is being a business, and part of this is part is part of the way that we are, is just really being able to, we kind of call it, call it unpack your thinking or show your math, um, but to really say, you know, why and to be challenged, why is that the answer, and really walk me, you know, walk me through your thinking. Um, and that is one of the places where I think law firms could really benefit from a partnership with some, you know, someone like a Deloitte or a PwC, because what I, what I do find in our partnerships with these big, with the big consulting firms is they have spent um, time. They seem to understand better the biz, sort of the business concerns and the business needs and that pra that practical piece of it. Um, and so that is um, sometimes I think a gap that you will, you will see for law firm lawyers, just having not been sort of not being on that that side of the problem, and to I think the point that other people have raised, you know, is that I do have you know I do have bosses, and those bosses are not they're not lawyers, they're business people, and so they're looking for you know they're looking for yes that technical legal advice, but something you know more practical and business minded on top of it. So I want to ask both. Uh... Uh, our other panelists to reflect on the question that Megan asked us, which is, 
what is the value proposition for talent? Because we still live in a talent business. I mean, one day I'll be a lawyer and you'll be a lawyer. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, we are lawyers. One day I'll be a robot and you'll be a robot. But that's a long time from now, although my friend Richard Suskin is actually on this call and he says not as long as you think. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we are competing for talent. And the big four are very aggressive in competing for talent in various ways. And so I wonder how do you think about the proposition for talent? And if each of you could just say a couple of words about that, because we're getting short to, close to the end, and then I'm going to ask Bob if he has some reflections on, on what he heard. So Joe, do you want to start us off there? Well, sure. I think that the answer as we come out of a global pandemic to what's next, the answer to that question is always talent, uh, because every corporation understandably believes they're in a unique position, they're doing business in unique cultures, and big thought leadership is not the answer, it's talent. And I've never met a client who needs 12,000 lawyers, right? Uh, but I can tell you they usually just need one, uh, but it's much easier to find that one if you've got 12,000 than 1,200 than 12, right? So finding talent and connecting it is what the big four do so well. They can actually grab somebody from a thousand miles away and put them on a team to be able to assist you. They also are really good in the one thing that law firms are not, which is making sure they develop that talent. So if the smartest person in every room is the room, you got to make sure everybody's in. And the big four do much better on diversity and inclusion in training people to make sure that you have great teams and the best teams are always the most diverse teams and the most conclusive teams. And which is why we've done something called Next Law Talent, which is try to train our lawyers to have the emotional intelligence uh, that the best business consultants have to use these processes. Thank you. And they are, they're, they're always ranked big four, best places to work, best places to work for women. They have detailed training programs, et cetera. Graham, you're in a very interesting position because you both need ever chance to have great lawyers, but you also need to hire people who understand law but who also have these other complementary skills. And I wonder how you're thinking about talent there. Yeah, I, th I think, um, yeah, I agree with what Joe said about law firms and talent management. I, I think we can learn a lot from people about nurturing and giving opportunities to people who identify as talent. I think interestingly for me, recruiting non-lawyers to come and work in a lawyer environment in an ALSP, I think we've got a great selling point that the, the ones who are really interested in this area um, like Megan, I would suspect, and she, she's got to say, but they're very excited by the fact they are operating in this alternative world, but very close to a major law firm. And it is different to being working with lawyers in a big four environment. So the people we've recruited have said it actually is, you know, a better environment for me to try and develop what I want to do because it's it's at the heart. I'm trying to do something to change the legal profession. Being at the heart of a law of a law firm, a big law firm is really exciting and interesting for that. On the downside, we need to try and crack as big law how we get, um, I suppose, our non-lawyers to the equivalent of equity partner status, um, which, you know, being honest in Evershed Sutherland, we have partner equivalents, that's how we call it, but they're called partner equivalents, that's not a partner. So, so I think our fundamental structure um, of, recognizing non-lawyers as genuine partners as equity partners um, is is going to hold us back in in the longer term and hence probably why connect will become more and more separated in the long term but i think for those genuine you know people want to change the sector being close to a big law firm is i think quite an exciting place for them to be um and you know it's definitely something we sell and and people feedback that it, it is real um the people we've recruited from Big Four, Deloitte's particularly, that, that's their feedback. So Graham, I'll just give you one hint, stop calling them non-lawyers. That would be a yeah. good start at the beginning. I've never met a person who likes to be called a non-lawyer. There, there's, well, there, there, <laughs> I've learned recently, there are three groupings in the world, isn't there? And you know, you'll tell me to shut up because I'm always get. but uh, yeah, lawyers, lawyers categorize the world as lawyers and non-lawyers. So I fall into that mistake. I apologize to everyone. Um, and you're right to pick me up and Dave. Having done a, corporate m a transaction recently with with a bunch of corporate lawyers the corporate lawyers have got a third category there's corporate lawyers 
there's lawyers and then there's non-lawyers yeah so i i am not a corporate <laughs> lawyer so i i'm in a lower subgroup already and i do i know how irritating was so i do apologize you're absolutely <laughs> right. right megan just a word if you could since you started us on this yeah absolutely so just really quickly I, I think as i was saying before client expectations are changing and they want more than just the deep legal expertise i think it's that business acumen that tracy's already talked about so i think for all of our our lawyers making sure we've got well-rounded education that can help tie that legal solution to the business and business strategy for longer term solutions is definitely something you know that I think all lawyers will be looking for to connect. I also think there's a you know there's a tipping point between general skills and expertise. And so when you look at things that are non-legal skills, some of the project management, deep technology expertise, I think you know, making sure that you're getting the right balance to serve your clients will be, again, I, I go the kumbaya, kumbaya marrying up with the big four and in big law. But I, I do think, you know, that, that deeply, that deep technology expertise can be that partnership versus the building in-house. Thank you, Megan. So Bob, what a discussion you started. You have any, we've only got a minute or so left. Anything you want to leave us with? Yes, thank you, David. I'll make it brief. And I, I want to thank all our panelists. You've been terrific today. Um, when I put this together, uh, I really didn't know where it would end. But right now, what I hope people do who read this, I hope leaders of law firms will read this, they might say, uh, I don't like this methodology. Well, that's good if you do it something else yourself. And what I hope people do is take a look at this and say, okay, here's our strategic playing field. We are in different geographies. We're in different practice markets, but here's how we see it. Here's what we do for clients. And here's where our com competition is. If they do that work, I think they'll be um, uh, much further ahead from where they are today. I'm a little concerned though, as I, as I looked at the statistics that too many law firms will say, oh, 70% of the people are doing nothing. We're comfortable now, let's not do anything. And that's a real threat. But as you do the work and you look at your firm and you decide how you're gonna compete you know, over the next decade, ask yourself a couple of questions. First is, how much work do we do today that could be done by somebody who doesn't have a JD? And I will tell you that you'll be very surprised if you do an honest assessment of that quite a bit. And if that's true, why aren't you delivering those skills and those people to your clients today? Why do you use associates to do that? Because I will tell you, if you don't, someone else will and you're vulnerable. And the second thing I would say is think about how you deliver consistently worldwide because your competition today in consultancies has have deep methodologies and as a client when you um, hire somebody you want the same expertise and delivery capabilities globally as you can get in new york city so that consistency is something also that you have to figure out and if you do those things i think you'll put your firm in in very good stead to compete in the future Thank you, Bob. I think the one thing we can all say for sure is that we are all better off for having had the opportunity to think about this research. I urge everyone on the webinar to go to our website at the Center on the Legal Profession, go to the practice, subscribe to the practice. This is where you will get this kind of cutting edge research. It's actually quite reasonable. Everybody in the firm gets an opportunity to read it. Uh, and I hope that you will continue this conversation with us at the center and with our great uh, panelists, because whether we think about these issues or not, these are the future. And again, to quote my friend Richard Susskind, the, the future always arrives way sooner than you think it will. Thank you all very much for giving us a piece of your most valuable personal resource, your time. We look forward to being in touch Watch this space. We will have more developments to come as we learn them. I'm David Wilkins again. Thank you on behalf of the Center on the Legal Profession and all of our panelists for a wonderfully engaging discussion. Thank you. <laughs>